praise the Lord and good evening. We do greet you in that wonderful name, Lord Jesus Christ. Certainly, we count it a blessing just to be able to come together with you one more time in our midweek encouragement. We do thank the Lord for his protection and his provision. And here this evening, for just a few moments, we hopefully would like to share something encouraging with you from the word of the Lord. In the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 7 through 10, we'd like to just talk to you for a few moments tonight in terms of thank God for grace. First and 2 Corinthians were written by the Apostle Paul, and these two letters were written close together. The Apostle Paul established a church at Corinth during his second missionary journey, and Paul spent about a year and a half there. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians from Ephesus during his third missionary journey, and 1 Corinthians is divided into two parts. Part 1 covers from chapter 1 through chapter 6, where Paul is responding to a report from the house of Chloe about disorders in the church. And part 2 covers from chapter 7 through chapter 16, where Paul responds to a letter from the saints at Corinth concerning holy living. Now, the theme of this letter is sanctification. Now, following the letter of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul sent his son in the gospel, Titus, to check on the progress of the saints at Corinth, how they had responded to his letter. And then Paul met Titus in Macedonia, where Titus gave Paul the report concerning the church in Corinth. Now, this report was mostly favorable, but Titus also noted that there was an aggressive minority in Corinth that was opposed to Paul. Therefore, Paul wrote 2 Corinthians to defend his ministry and his apostolic authority. He wrote this from Macedonia in the city of Philippi. Here in today's text, in chapter 12, we find the Apostle Paul presenting a strong defense of his apostolic authority as he is compared to other ministers and found wanting by the aggressive minority in Corinth that is opposed to his apostolic authority. The Apostle Paul refers to the apostles that this group at Corinth were able to receive in chapter 11 and verse 5, where he states that he is not a wit, meaning an ounce behind him. He further goes on to say in verses 19 through 20 that you are able to tolerate so many different types of people, but for some reason you have a problem or you seek to discredit me. It is amazing how the chosen of the Lord are always or generally in can't-win situations. For example, the Apostle Paul did not depend on the saints at Corinth for his financial needs. While he was with them, he stated in chapter 11, verses 7 through 9, uh, basically that he worked. Uh, Paul had the trade of being a tent maker. He worked so that he would not be a burden on them and he could financially support himself. Now, one might think that this is a good thing, especially in today's climate, in a climate where people look at preachers as constantly uh, looking to take money, uh, deplete them of their finances. And yet, even this was taken the wrong way. If we look at chapter 12, verse 13, here the apostle states that if you were made to feel inferior to other churches because I did not take from you, then please forgive me. So Paul is in a can't-win situation. If he takes the finance, then he is just using the saints to take their money and leave town 
and go start his next church. Now, if he doesn't take the money, then he is too good for us because he receives financial support from other churches. Now, this is the life of the chosen on a daily basis. There is a difference between the called and the chosen. Now, the called are those who have responded to the call of Christ to salvation. Those are the ones who have chosen to respond to the Lord's call. They heard the Lord's voice and said yes and surrendered their life to Christ. These are the called. Now the chosen are those that are pulled out from among the called to do more than just live a sanctified and holy life. They are no better or no worse just chosen to fulfill a divine purpose placed in their lives. Notice what is recorded in St. Luke chapter 12, verse 48. To whom much is given, much is required. Please understand that not every child of God will be the next Moses or the next Mary, the mother of Jesus. Not every child of God will be the next Apostle Paul and not every child of God is destined to be the next Apostle William Lee Bonner or Bishop Gilbert Earl Patterson. But think about this. Every one of these individuals had to have a beginning before we came to know them. We came to know them because they had been pulled out to be used for the work of the kingdom. They were chosen. Remember to whom much is given, much is required. When chosen to do a great work in the kingdom, a casual relationship with the Lord just won't cut it. You must have an intimate relationship with the Lord. Now that word intimate means very personal. In a casual relationship, general expressions and words are exchanged and depth is not sought. It's all surface and not looking to go any deeper. But in an intimate relationship, personal things are shared. And when personal things are shared, revelations are made. With revelation comes power. But this power comes at a great cost. It doesn't just happen. Notice what the Apostle Paul said when he had developed such an intimate relationship with Christ. He said that he went to the third heaven, chapter 12, verse 2, when he was stoned over 14 years ago in the city of Lystra and drug out of the city and left for dead. You'll find that recorded in Acts chapter 14. Paul had now reached a place in Christ that no other in his generation had. Now, please understand that we think we know ourselves, but believe me, God knows us better. He knows what we can and what we cannot handle. Here, Paul writes that, and lest I should be exalted above, above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Notice that Paul did not just receive a revelation over 14 years ago at Lystra when he went to the third heaven. He stated that he received an abundance of revelation. The Lord placed in him a great investment. If I could just use a natural analogy or an example, I would say take an armored car armored car is built in such a way that it's prepared to carry great wealth, whether it be valuables or finance. And whatever is being carried in that armored car, uh, it, it, it is more valuable than the armored car itself. What's being transported is more, and more valuable than what is transporting it. And so when you consider what God has placed in us is more valuable 
than what God has enclosed it with, meaning this flesh, this earthly tabernacle. This can only mean that Paul had a very intimate relationship with Christ. To establish a relationship like this, you must invest a lot of time. Time that others enjoy pleasures of life and leisure time. You are in prayer somewhere, and while others enjoy earthly successes through finance and material blessings, you are in sackcloth and ashes trying to pray and fast someone through a life crisis. I want you to know a lot of sacrifices required in an intimate relationship. There will be some lonely days and even more trying nights. Paul said, as a result of the level that this relationship has reached, he was given a messenger of Satan to buffet him. Now, the word buffet means to hit or beat, to strike against forcefully, to batter repeatedly. Now, many have speculated what the thorn might be. Some have said possibly Paul's poor eyesight some have said possibly his stature. He was short in stature and struggled with a Napoleon complex. And some have speculated possibly his appearance as he was said not to be the best looking man. Uh, but if you would bear with me for a moment, I would like to add to the possibilities of what the thorn was. Paul said it was a messenger of Satan which means it was a demon, a fallen angel. Then Paul said it was sent to buffet him, which means it was given a job. It was given an assignment. And that assignment was to repeatedly strike against him. Notice what the Apostle Paul said about this messenger's repeated attacks in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 he says, because of my status, I'm always working. I have more scars than I can count, more prison time than I care to remember. Life, my life, threatened more times than I can remember. Five times I've been beaten by the Jews with 39 stripes. Three times beaten with rods. Once stoned in Lystra and there stoned to death. Three times I was in the water due to shipwrecks, one time even a night and a day in the water, traveling more than I can remember, often in danger from robbers, dangerous animals, and deceitful brethren. But I kept on going in the midst of weariness, pain in my body, loss of sleep, hunger, often cold and lacking the proper clothing. And beside all of this, I had the care and responsibility of the church upon me. Therefore, Paul asked the Lord, please remove this messenger that has brought so much pain in my life. Paul said he went to the Lord three times asking him to remove this messenger the Lord said, no, my grace is sufficient. What is grace? Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. That is grace. And there are four things, at least four things grace will do. One, it produces holiness. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 and 12 for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world notice the very grace that brings salvation also teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldliness and live in a way that is honoring to the Lord Two, grace compels service. What gives you, what gives us the desire to serve 
when the natural man wants to turn inward in self-focus or self-pity, it is grace. Acts chapter 4, verse 32 and 33, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Without the grace of God at work in our heart, there will be no desire to serve truly as unto the Lord. And number three, grace encourages sacrifice. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And, who, who, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he has purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, oft times when we hear that scripture, we think someone's about to raise an offering or ask us for money. Please do not make that mistake of trivity, of attributing giving cheerfully only to money. Through the grace of God, we should give our lives to him daily, cheerfully. It compels, it encourages sacrifice, not just in our finances, but in our daily walk and our relationship with him. We sacrifice many things in order to be close to him. Grace, number four, endures or it enables endurance. It enables endurance. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse nine. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. No matter how difficult your struggle may be as a child of God, I want you to know, please remember, his grace is sufficient. What he did for Paul, he would do for you. God bless you. Until we meet again, Shalom.